Welcome to The Jenna Ellis Show, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. Good evening and welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. A lot going on in the United States Supreme Court as the justices have accepted the appeal from former President Trump out of the D.C. Circuit on the issue of presidential immunity. So that has delayed the pending uh, DOJ trial that was set to begin on March 4th. And now the justices are saying that they will hear oral argument the week of April 22nd and with a decision forthcoming potentially not until the end of June. So the issue in that case is, quote, whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office. So the justices will hear that case and have already heard the ballot question stemming from a case arising from uh, the Colorado Supreme Court on whether or not Donald Trump will be kicked off the ballot. And now a uh, a judge in Illinois has kicked kicked Trump off the ballot late last night and his campaign reacted with this statement. The Soros-funded Democrat front groups continue to attempt to interfere in the election and deny President Trump his rightful place on the ballot. Today, an activist Democrat judge in Illinois summarily overruled the state's board of elections and contradicted earlier decisions from dozens of other state and federal jurisdictions. This is an unconstitutional ruling that we will quickly appeal. In the meantime, President Trump remains on the Illinois ballot, is dominating in the polls, and will make America great again. That coming from, that is coming from Stephen Chung, who is the Trump spokesperson. So Alan Dershowitz is an, a, a law professor emeritus at Harvard Law. And uh, Alan, so what do you make of all of these controversies that are in front of the U.S. Supreme Court? Will they do the constitutional thing? Well, of course, I wrote a book about all this called Get Trump, which is based on the attempt by Democrats to keep Donald Trump off the ballot. Uh, There have been at least six or seven of them. Uh, They will all fail. Um, There are also efforts to try to prevent him from um, legitimately winning by prosecuting him and trying to bring him to trial uh, on the eve of the election. This is the weaponization of the American criminal justice system for partisan purposes. And it's brought to us by law professors like Professor Lawrence Tribe, Uh, and other zealots who want to misuse the Constitution to their own ideological and political purposes. Uh, The efforts to keep Trump off the ballot will fail. Uh, Efforts to convict him of crime will probably have a mixed result. Uh, The Supreme Court, by deciding to take the immunity case, has made it very difficult, maybe even impossible, to bring the D.C. case, which also means the Fulton County case, to trial uh, before the election. So it's likely that the only cases that might come to the trial before the election are the two very, very minor cases, one involving hush money paid in the New York case uh, and the other involving whether he uh, waived a piece of classified material in front of a journalist uh, in, in the Florida case. So um, the efforts, I think, to interfere with the election are not, are not likely to succeed. And Alan, as you and I have discussed uh, th- these topics before, you've mentioned, and I completely agree with you, that this isn't uh, about Donald Trump in the sense of what precedent should be. And so how much do you think the Supreme Court could be persuaded by the partisan politicking and make this more about Trump in perhaps a narrow ruling versus what they should do, uh, which is to simply enforce and interpret the U.S. Constitution as written, regardless of whether this was Donald Trump or anyone else? Well, that's what they should do, of course. And I think it will be unanimous and near unanimous that he can't be kept off the ballot on the basis of the 14th Amendment. The immunity case is uphill and is difficult. Um, most academics and many media have said that there's no chance it will succeed at all. This is just a delaying tactic. I don't agree with that. I think there is some chance 
that the Supreme Court might grant the president some degree of immunity, not the amount that his lawyer demanded when he said that the president can uh, be immunized even if he orders the seals to even if he orders the seals to kill the the president. That was going too far. Yeah, and and so where should the Supreme Court draw the line then? Because uh, really, the D.C. Circuit held that. Uh, it's essentially immunity lapses when a president leaves office rather than drawing a distinction where we've seen in legislative immunity uh, where official acts are covered by immunity so that you don't have your political opponents prosecuting you either during office or after, uh, but things that are done in a private capacity, say, as a candidate for public office or for re-election, um, those things would be open and subject to civil and even criminal liability. Look, I agree. I think both sides have overstated their positions, as is typical in America today. Uh, We see uh, extremists on both sides making arguments that uh, make no sense at all. Um, It's obviously wrong to say that a president loses his immunity once he leaves office. That's absurd. That means there's no immunity at all that the subsequent president can prosecute a president. Um, And and the other is that uh, um, the uh, uh, his his argument went too far as well. So I think the court will split the difference. And how soon do you think we will get uh, the ballot case that has already been argued that was uh, earlier this month and it's been pending for almost a month now and we're heading into Super Tuesday on Tuesday and um, even though that decision has been stayed so Trump still remains on the ballot in Colorado and Maine, we now have this issue out of Illinois. The Supreme Court does need to uh, give America some direction here quickly. Well, it does, but I think courts are playing too much of a role in our election, and I hope courts get out of the business and prosecutors get out of the business of telling us who we can vote for and who we can't vote for. But uh, I think the Supreme Court will give us guidance. Yeah, well, I hope that uh, they will sooner rather than later. And um, how, if anything, Alan, do you think this is going to, um, to shape the turnout heading into 2024 if we have all of these uncertainties on both the Democrat and, of course, the Republican side. I think the turnout will be high. I think it's absurd to think that people will stay home, even though 100,000 people uh, or a couple of hundred thousand people didn't vote uh, for a candidate in the Michigan election. That's in a primary where it doesn't matter at all. The the, the outcome was clear. Um, what um, That won't happen in the general election. There'll be a massive turnout. Mostly people will be voting yeah. against somebody for somebody, but people who vote against them, people who hate Biden are going to vote against them. They won't stay home. Yeah. And I think everyone really recognizes that this is such an important election. Alan Dershowitz, really appreciate your analysis. We'll be right back with our power panel to address the political side coming up next in Thursday's Roundup. Throughout history, there are clear moments that define our nation's path, and now you can own a piece of that history. I'm thrilled to announce the official Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin from our friends at Legacy Precious Metals in partnership with Speaker Gingrich. This limited edition, one ounce, 99.99% silver coin commemorates the historic victory in 1994 when the Republican Party, under Speaker Gingrich's guidance, took control of Congress. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin also symbolizes the transformative political platform that led to the landmark achievements like the overhaul of the U.S. welfare system and the Balanced Budget Act. This is a limited edition coin that will sell out. So whether you're looking for the perfect gift or you want to own a piece of history, act fast before they run out. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin is more than an investment. It's a tribute to honest government and America. You can order it online at NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com. That's NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com and use promo code Jenna, that's J-E-N-N-A, to get $10 off your purchase. Go to NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com now. And now it's time for our Thursday Roundup, which are the top trending topics of the week with our power panel. So 
So joining me this Thursday is John Jackson, who is a former Democrat strategist. We have Matt Tiermand, who is a Claremont Institute Lincoln Fellow, and John Cardio, who is a former NYPD officer and also GOP strategist. So gentlemen, welcome to today's Power Panel. And first topic, uh, we, of course, talked with Alan Dershowitz in the opening about the legal side of uh, Trump's cases that are now pending in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. But let's get to the political side. So, of course, Nikki Haley had a lot to say. Watch this. You see, he surrounds himself with the political establishment. All of the congressional leaders are all around him. Every single one of them are responsible for the fact they've got nothing done. Look at what happened yesterday. Trump loses the case on having immunity for whatever comes next. Republicans lose a fight on the border. They lose a fight on Israel aid. The head of the Republican Party loses her job. Everything that Donald Trump Trump touches, it's chaos. All right, John Cardillo, let's go to you first. Uh, is Nikki Haley right? Uh, not really. I mean, look, partially, but but uh, it, r- let's go with Ronna McDaniel, the, the head of the RNC. I mean, Trump endorsed her three times. There was no chaos. He wanted her until she couldn't raise the money to pay his legal bills. And, and the RNC was in uh, that, that. The RNC is in chaos, right? I mean, right now it's a paper tiger of an organization. But the bigger problem here is Nikki Haley is campaigning and campaigning like it's 1996. I mean, the woman is just boring and uninspiring. She's got mega donors because the military uh, industrial, uh, big, you know, big military industrial knows that she'll be the best thing that ever happened to him, arguably more profitable than Dick Cheney and and George Bush. And so they're going to keep pumping money into her until it just becomes untenable. You know, but but no, I mean, look, she he didn't lose, really lose the immunity case. Everybody knew that was going up to the Supreme Court. They decided to take the case. We'll probably have their decision on whether or not a president is absolutely immune when they come down with all the other big decisions in July. I think they're going to hear the case uh, late to mid-April. Right. So we should see it in July, which will pave the way for Jack Smith to potentially have the trial start before Election Day. But I don't think it's going to um I don't think it's going to uh, reach a verdict. And then with regards to Congress, nobody has been. And listen, I've been very critical of Trump. Everybody knows that I've gotten beaten up every day for it. But it's laughable to listen to Nikki Haley criticize the establishment. I mean, she is the living embodiment of the establishment. All of those establishment politicians love her. So, yeah, maybe she's right in the technical sense, but she's a bigger part of the problem than Trump. And John Jackson, let's go to you next. Uh, Democrats were hoping that the DOJ would get to a trial before the election. So now with the Supreme Court taking up the immunity case, is this a setback for Democrats in November? It's a potential setback because the reality is you've got your pro-Trump folks who would like to delay everything till after the election. And we know that you're not going to convict a sitting president if Trump wins. Uh, And then you have Democrats who, if you're able to get a conviction before the election, this can be used to campaign to independents. We know the Republican Party, most Republicans are going to stick with Trump, but it's these independents, these independents who aren't quite sure. They don't really like either choice. They don't really like Biden or Trump. And so they could vote anyway in November or they might vote for RFK. Who knows? So we've got a lot of impressionable voters out here who can be persuaded to vote a different way in November and a conviction uh, of Trump could absolutely change that. Yeah, so Matt, uh, what do you think about the RFK factor? I mean, it seems like nobody's really excited about Trump versus Biden repeat. And now with the Supreme Court taking their time, uh, you know, a lot of people in America are watching this, seeing how this is unfolding. Um, are they going to want to go potentially third party just because of all of the drama? Well, I think turnout's going to be pretty low because of the lack of enthusiasm for both major party uh, top of ticket candidates. I do think that RFK is going to be a spoiler, but we don't really know yet where he's going to draw more from a historical Democrat, a Kennedy, who, by the way, if JFK was alive today, he'd probably be much more Republican on policy issues. Uh, The fact is that Trump is a circus, which is why the primaries played out 
as it has with all these indictments, you know, who votes in primaries, the most polarized part of the electorate who actually show up, you know, before the general election, they care. It's the same thing as the who uh, answers pollsters now. You know, I've spoken to pollsters and they say they have to call many thousands of people because they have a one percent response rate. So who responds? Those who feel passionately about the candidacies and the, the electoral cycle. And the majority of Americans do not. Nikki Haley is a horrible candidate for this moment in time in America, yet she's still pulling a third of primary voters in a stillborn dead campaign. So, you know, this cycle doesn't bode well for anyone. If everyone could lose, I think they would. Yeah, well, uh, John, let's get you to weigh in on the potential outcome of the Supreme Court case. I mean, in in uh, maybe a, a crazy world or, in my view, an unconstitutional world, uh, you know, Trump is kicked off the ballot. The Supreme Court doesn't go his way on that case or potentially um, the presidential immunity case that uh, he will end up facing the DOJ at a trial. Um, if something like that happens and either he's convicted or he is actually kicked off of the ballot in now at least three states because Illinois has now uh, taken him off the ballot. Does that change what the Republican Party does either pre or post convention? Well, look, I think it certainly adds a variable, right? It might push more people to the independent. You know, you're the constitutional attorney, Jenna, but as a lay person looking at this, one of the things that uh, was concerning to me was the argument, and it may be a very valid legal argument that, yeah, Trump uh, or any president could have special operators go and, and kill a political opponent. Okay. People say, well, if they're a sitting president, yes, they can do that. But that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, and again, as a non-lawyer, because I don't believe the founders uh, um, they intended for a sitting president to be able to kill their political rivals. And if only impeachment and removal are the remedy, that same legal notion would then allow them to go kill every member of Congress. So they couldn't be impeached and removed. And then what do we wind up with a dictatorship? So I don't know, just as a lay person looking at this through the lens of common sense, I'm not so sure Trump has a slam dunk case here. You know, as much as people say the Supreme Court's not politicized, we, we know it is. It's, but I do it's going to be really interesting, with, and we got to leave it there with the power panel, but we will see you on the flip side of the break for more of the Thursday Roundup. As you know, my friend Mike Lindell has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of their life. He didn't stop by simply creating the best pillow. Mike created the Giza Dream bed sheets. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me, which is crucial for my busy schedule. Mike found the world's best cotton. It is ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. Mike's Giza sheets come with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. The Giza Dream Sheets come in a variety of sizes and colors. Mike's latest incredible deal is the sale of the year. For a limited time, you will receive 50% off the Giza Dream Sheets. You will also receive a set for as low as $29.98. So go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square, and use the promo code Jenna. There you will find not only this amazing offer, but also deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the MyPillow 2.0 mattress topper, which I have and I love, the MyPillow kitchen towel sets, and now even flannel sheets and so much more. We definitely need flannel sheets for as crazy as all of this weather has been lately. So go to MyPillow.com and make sure you use the promo code Jenna or call one 800 564 Eight four seven five. That's one eight hundred five six four eight four seven five, and use the promo code Jenna. And our power panel is back with us for Thursday's roundup. We have John Jackson, Matt Tiermand, and John Cardio, and. Uh, gentlemen, Mitch McConnell actually announced that he is retiring from the GOP leadership and John Cornyn is the first of the Senate Republicans to actually put his hat in the ring. Let's get that headline up. Uh, Senator John Cornyn declares candidacy for minority leader after McConnell steps down. So this is what McConnell said in part on the floor of the Senate yesterday. After all this time, I still got a thrill walking into the Capitol, and especially on this venerable floor, knowing that we, each of us, have the honor to represent our states and do the important work of our country. 
But Father Time remains undefeated. I'm no longer the young man sitting in the back, hoping colleagues would remember my name. It's time for the next generation of leadership. Matt, I got to come to you first. Uh, it's time for the next generation of leadership. I think it was time like 20 years ago. <laughs> so uh, Mitch McConnell yeah. stepping down, uh, but he's not stepping down till November. Yeah. Well, he's got to see it through. He certainly is not uh, too pleased with the top of ticket, though he did do a good job working with President Trump on his biggest mandate, which was the judicial uh, appointments and getting them marshaled through the Senate. Uh, it's funny when he says next generation, you've got Susan Collins over his uh, right shoulder in our perspective. Uh, I think you're going to see beyond Cornyn, you're going to see more next generation leaders who are really almost his generation. John Thune uh, is highly expected to announce he only came back into the Senate instead of going to K Street with his wife to join uh, the ranks of lobbyists pocketing lots of money on the chance that he could make a play for this uh, when he ran for reelection last cycle. Uh, and I also think John Barroso as well in Wyoming may make a play for it. None of these are really a much younger generation. Obviously, personally, and you and I know each other and talk about these sort of things. I would love to see a Ted Cruz, but, you know, he's well disliked among the chamber, which is exactly why we'd like to see a Ted Cruz or somebody like this come into leadership. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit more of the same would be my guess, no matter uh, what Father Time says to uh, Cocaine Mitch. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, that's exactly what we thought in the, the House speaker race as well and wanting to see somebody like a Jim Jordan. And I was very pleased to see that we actually have somebody like a Mike Johnson. Uh, but that was after, you know, several rounds of the establishment Republicans. But John Jackson, um, from the Democrat side, I mean, you know, is there anybody that you think uh, the Democrats and Chuck Schumer would like to see that maybe they think they can work with uh, better than a Mitch McConnell um, in terms of, of actually getting legislation through the Senate that's more bipartisan? None of those folks have a chance at uh, becoming minority leader. Uh, and honestly, I think Democrats could uh, take some notes from this playbook. There's a lot of Democrats who've been around too long, who, who need to retire. Uh, if you look at the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus, they've blocked the whole generation of uh, basically young talent from getting into Congress because they won't retire. So uh, I, I advise, you know, the rest of Congress, if you're around Mitch McConnell's age, you should probably, you know, look at retiring, look at not being in leadership and, you know, understand there's other generations that have other things to say. Yeah, well, so, uh, John Cardillo, what about somebody like a Rand Paul? Yeah, but again, you know, to John and Matt's points, I don't think uh, I don't I don't think he's going to have the political juice across the spectrum of establishment Republicans. I mean, I'd love to see it, right? I mean, look, it, it, like you said, Jenna, we knew that cocaine Mitch became relaxing Mitch twenty years ago. Right? He's going to be next to Gorka on those commercials soon. But you think a guy like McConnell has always been a really savvy operator. I have to believe he does this with some conditions, with some stipulations to whomever comes in. I think McConnell's still going to have a lot of power because one thing that guy loves is money and power. I mean, if people remember going back, I think it was 2014 when he, when he ran against Bevin in the primary in Kentucky, which has a voter universe, only a few million voters. He spent like 12 to 14 million bucks to keep his seat in the primary. So in that primary to keep his uh, uh, place in the general. So I don't see a guy like McConnell just stepping aside without having a lot of input, a lot of input going forward. So whoever comes in, I don't think they're going to be acting that autonomously. I think McConnell's still going to have a pretty heavy finger on the scale. Hmm. That's an interesting perspective and may, uh, may be why he's taking until November uh, while announcing this now so that he can have a hand in his replacement. So uh, Matt Tierman, how much will Trump's uh, potential endorsement, if and I'm sure he will weigh in on this if, if history speaks anything about uh, Donald Trump wanting to weigh in, um, how much would his pick potentially override if it uh, was different than McConnell's? 
Well, it would certainly create chaos and there'll probably be some backroom talks to avoid that, given that, you know, these sort of battles do have down ballot implications in an already fraught cycle. Uh, but they're certainly not going to agree in a first round discussion, because even if you saw that uh, that pick you played of McConnell, Thune is always over his shoulder. Uh, Thune is certainly not MAGA. The Senate is the August body, right? Six year terms. The average age of these guys is quite high. Look at Chuck Grassley. It's impressive. He does every county and lots some push-ups, but they are quite old. This is the essence of the establishment is in the U.S. Senate. Uh, they've been around a long time. The incumbency rates in the Senate are much higher than the House, which is also quite high. Uh, so I think you're going to see a battle, but they're going to try and keep it behind closed doors. The question is, does Trump want to use this to, in his usual framework of, you know, they're not coming after me, they're coming after you, I'm just in the way, and try and make a circus of it. History is any indicator expect a circus from Trump world. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we're seeing a lot of changes in leadership, including, of course, Speaker um, as Speaker Mike Johnson and uh, then with stepping down of Ronna McDaniel and um, John Jackson. We need to weigh in on that. Um, I know it's, you know, the RNC, but, you know, I, I was a little bit surprised that Lara Trump was uh, floated and, and endorsed by Donald Trump while there is still a Republican primary going on. Do you see that as a conflict of interest? I definitely see it as a conflict of interest, but you know, there's a whole wing of the party that would back it. And the reality is, is Trump wants his hands in all aspects of the party, and being, he, he wants to have that power. And uh, I could, I could definitely see uh, that go ahead and, 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 and going through um, if it hasn't already. I honestly, I, I haven't been following that extremely closely. But I, I don't think it should happen because how can you have yeah, an impartial? And we'll have to leave it there. But uh, John Jackson, appreciate it. And yeah, we'll have to see what happens. But uh, we'll be back with more on Jenna Ellis tonight right after this. Well, if you're thinking of going to Wendy's anytime soon, you may want to read the headlines from this story that Wendy's is now changing potentially their menus and was accused by some reporters of price surging. So this coming from Changing America and also in The Hill, Wendy's hints at possible surge pricing in the future then backtracks. So the story went on to give a kind of a background and uh, you can bring up the next slide. During a February 15th investor call, Wendy's CEO CEO Kirk Tanner said the company plans to spend about $20 million to roll out a digital menu board to all restaurants by the end of 2005. Uh, Tanner, who's the CEO, said this, we will begin testing more enhanced features like a dynamic pricing and day part offering along with AI enabled menu changes and suggestive selling. And after widespread media reports that the company would employ Uber-like surge pricing, the company issued a new statement saying that it would not raise prices dynamically. So joining me now is Tho Bishop, who is part of the Mises Institute. And uh, Tho, you know, th this was really uh, hilarious. Some of the memes that came out from this, especially because Wendy's is known as like the one fast food chain that actually has a hilarious uh, Twitter or X account. And I think that this was just a really bad PR move that Wendy's just didn't anticipate. No, absolutely. And, and I, you know, people, they hear search pricing, they think about the Uber drive that you know, costs a whole lot more than they were expecting after going out, you know, on a night. But I think it's a very interesting kind of broader conversation about prices and the way that modern technology allows firms to kind of adapt to pricing. And so, you know, I know with Wendy's, they try to clarify, right? Like, oh, we're not going to raise prices. We might lower them at certain times. And of course, if you've been to a Wendy's lately or any fast food chain with the inflationary environment that we have right now, you know, you know that that four for four uh, for a couple of years ago is now a five or six dollar meal and things like that. So we've already seen surge pricing in fast food and other <laughs> other important assets out there um, just in keeping up with inflation. And so they're saying, oh, this would allow us to reduce in terms of uh, in slower times, right, it, it, we might be able to bring out more customers by being able to offer a deal. And of course, you know, really, this is not that much differently than, you know, having coupons or, or sales. Um, it's kind of similar to the way that McDonald's does their McRib, where it's only on the menu and pork prices are kind of a certain area there. 
And so it's a major PR, I think, uh, uh, you know, bad, bad few days of PR for Wendy's, which again, usually very astute at this sort of stuff. Um, but I think it opens up a far more interesting conversation about the way that um, you know, AI, digital billboards and the like um, can alter pricing for all sorts of things that we deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, well, I'm waiting for uh, the Wendy snarky tweet that's now aimed at themselves. They're famous on on X for roasting celebrities and having a lot of those things. So hopefully they'll uh, be good enough at PR to kind of roast themselves. But, you know, a lot of us who have used Uber and when I was in D.C., um, I exclusively used Uber because it was actually less expensive, even with those surge prices. And you could just anticipate that sometimes when the demand was greater or the trips would take longer, then, of course, you're going to pay a little more. But we don't have um, kind of a supply and demand problem at certain times of the day with Baconators. So, you know, what's to stop Wendy's or any fast food chain from more of a corporate greed side of it by using uh, these digital boards to change prices, maybe without customers really recognizing it? Well, ultimately, it still comes down to consumer demand, right? You know, the, the reason why we the prices that we have right now is that that's kind of the, the threshold where companies expect to be able to maximize their profits. And so that doesn't change here. Um, now again, you know, I, I think this is part of the problem though, is that there is a, I think a culture of distrust. I think there's a culture of economic anxiety and, you know, so that's going to lead to kind of assumptions about, oh, well, you know, this Wendy's company, you know, they're, they're going to try to exploit customers. They're going to try to, to hurt us. They're, they're just in it for the greed. And, you know, there's certainly bad businesses out there and I'm not, I have I've got no background on, on Wendy's, you know, they might be a bad business too. I've, I've been a big, big fan of their burgers for, for a while, you know, fresh, never frozen beef. Um, but ultimately there's still a mechanism there where, you know, they don't want to price themselves out of the market. Um, and so that's always kind of in the back of your, you know, in, in the back of these companies' minds. Um, and so, you know, you know, if you know, prices have already gone up, you know, there is, and, and they're getting the, the, the flack for it too. For a lot of pressures that they have nothing to do with, right? They can't control the price of their tomatoes. They can't tr- control the price of their beef. Um, the, the shrinkflation stuff that you know Joe Biden did his, his uh, commercial about during the Super Bowl, right? You know, that's a, that's they're responding to the inflation inherent in the economy. It's not out of the greed of the companies. And so while I, I recognize the the anxiety out there, I would hesitate against kind of blaming the businesses themselves. In, in many parts, they are reacting to the economy that we're all dealing with. And again. An aspect of of you know this you know, these these uh, uh, dynamic pricing mechanisms could actually end up with savings um, in in some of those lower uh, traffic areas to try to bring in more customers to utilize that work shift that is you know there to take advantage of that you know 11 30 12 o'clock window 12 30 window if you start bringing in people at three o'clock with a lower menu item that you can change on the fly then you know, I think that is kind of the profits that uh, Wendy's is looking at more than just trying to uh, to screw over the customer with an extra, you know, dollar fifty on your baconator. Yeah, and we've already seen some of these uh, dynamic uh, billboards at at places like Starbucks, for example, that will put your customized order on the screen. I mean, I've certainly been in those drive-throughs, uh, seeing that. And so there's always, um, it seems like, a skepticism of any new use of technology. And like AI, e- Elon Musk thinks um, and has said that you know this is going to is the greatest existential threat to humanity. And um, we have about a minute left, but uh, Tho Bishop. Um, is it good to have healthy skepticism, but also recognize that a lot of this technology isn't quite as dark in its actual reality usage as we might think? Yeah, my biggest concerns with AI come with like military matters and drones that are, you know, not being flown by human beings, but rather being programmed to target things. I think whenever you combine weaponry and technology, that's a whole different thing. And usually that is an involvement of the state, you know, taking over technology. Um, but I, I think there is sort of a, a reflexive backlash when there, there's some new innovations. You know, we saw it with the internet, we saw it with online shopping, we've seen it in a variety of ways. Again, so long as it's it's the private sector. And the more the private sector is not being interfered with and controlled and co-opted by the state, then you know, history has shown that usually these advancements are actually good for customers. Um, again, I don't want to become across as kind of a slappy for big business. Again, there's plenty of big businesses out there, but it's usually the businesses that are in bed with the government, not trying to sell you know, burgers out there. So I'm a lot less con- concerned about Wendy's than I would be Boeing. Um, but yeah, you know, so that's yeah. You know, but I understand the reasons for concerns, again, particularly with I- an environment like this, an economic environment. Anxiety is naturally going to lead to people being concerned. And so that's one of the the consequences that we're all having to deal with um, with some of the decisions that policymakers have made for us. Yeah, and, and I think we're all very concerned that uh, Congress isn't really taking AI as seriously as they should, uh, potentially, especially with uh, with companies that are in military technology. But when it comes to Wendy's, um, you know, this is why I always personally 
prefer Chick-fil-A because you can't ever go wrong with God's chicken. But uh, we'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. And our power panel is back for our last segment of Thursday's Roundup and our last topic. And so joining me is John Jackson, who's a former Democrat strategist, Matt Tierman, who is a Claremont Institute Lincoln Fellow, and John Cardio, who's former NYPD and a GOP strategist. So last topic today, gentlemen, uh, Hunter Biden's testimony on Congressional Hill. This is what Matt Gates had to say uh, to reporters following that testimony. I'd say that there were a number of interesting moments, but perhaps none more interesting than when Hunter Biden told us that he uh, joined the Burisma board to counter Russian aggression. I, I hadn't heard that one before, that thank goodness we had Hunter Biden on the Burisma board uh, because that was uh, central to his strategy to stand up to Vladimir Putin. Has he so, taken the fifth at all? No, he's, has, he's, he's, he's been responsive to questions. Has yeah. he told you exactly what value he brought to any of these wars, any of these companies yet? Have you guys asked him that? Yeah, we've asked those questions, and there is, there is an illusory value. It is a mirage to believe that Hunter Biden was engaged in international business. This was uh, a bribe mass masquerading as an international business transaction, nothing more, nothing less. John Jackson, we'll come to you first. Um, Republicans have made Hunter Biden a really big voting issue. Um, didn't really have much effect on 2020, but of course, uh, reports have now suggested that there was a lot that was hidden in terms of Hunter Biden's laptop, a lot of things on social media. So how important is this from a Democrat perspective heading into 2024? Right now, I don't see it really impacting Democrats or independents at the moment. There's no smoking gun out there. It does rile up the base. The base, the Republican base definitely gets riled up over this. And there's a lot of material there. I mean, this is a guy who's smoked crack and gotten a stripper pregnant and uh, clearly did some corrupt things. And they're trying to r tie it to the sitting president. Um, and right now, I don't even think the Republican Party is in agreement that you can tie uh, President Biden to this. John Cardillo, you may have a little bit different opinion. You know, I, I, sadly, I don't think people care. I mean, I mean, Hunter Biden's testimony is preposterous, right? I mean, history hasn't shown us a long line of crackhead war heroes. But the fact that he sat on the Burisma board long before there was really kinetic activity by Russia. I mean, there have been some skirmishes over Crimea. And for him to make that out the assertion that he was there as some kind of defender of liberty and defender of the innocents. And, and I've always said, I've long said, there is no innocent in the uh, uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict. To me, Zelensky and Putin are the bloods and the crypts. So, you know, Putin being the red and Zelensky being the blue, it even works, right, with their <laughs> national colors. But, uh, but that, that's, that's a preposterous assertion. When you combine that with Biden's statements way back when about uh, firing the prosecutor or them not getting the money. I mean, anybody, you don't have to have been in law enforcement, right? Anybody can see this is a bribery schema, much like Hunter Biden's art, his paintings. I mean, that's clearly a money laundering effort, right? But that all being said, we know what's going on. I think most of America feels pretty strongly that Joe Biden profited from this. Massive crimes were committed. Crimes that the dollar amounts of which make what La Cosa Nostra does and the Russian mob and the Asian triads look like child's play. I mean, we're talking billions and billions of dollars in crimes here, and the Biden family probably profited to nine figures. But sadly, I just don't think enough voters care about it. Like, like John Jackson said, yeah, it'll rile up the Republican base, but I don't think it moves voter needles. Hmm. And Matt Tierman, uh, what about House Republicans who have had this impeachment inquiry into Biden um, on a number of issues, including potential ties to his son, Hunter? Um, this really isn't going anywhere. I think that most of the base has kind of given up on that, especially now with this impeachment of Mayorkas that I think is a little bit ridiculous because even if that were successful, Biden is just going to put somebody else in there uh, that's going to be his border czar. So how much of this is just political theater versus the House actually doing some kind of legislative oversight? 
Certainly there is political theater. There's nothing incrementally new. If you recall in 2020, there were three major tranches of Hunter Biden corruption stories. There was the laptop that Rudy uh, Giuliani and Steve Bannon brought forward. There was the work I did on Bevin Cooney's emails that were given to me that showed all the transactions they were doing without FARA registration in China and Kazakhstan, in Ukraine, in Russia, and other places, including money laundering for the uh, Moscow mayor's mob-tied wife, who was on OFAC. Uh, and there was the Tony Bubble Linsky uh, discussion that Schweitzer brought forward and Tucker gave co gave uh, coverage to, where he said emphatically, and this was a very credible businessman, that it wasn't just Hunter, it was James Biden, uh, Jim Biden, his brother, uh, who also has been brought into Congress for uh, for hearings and did not handle himself too credibly, had to walk back many of his statements for risk of perjury charges being levied. Uh, so I actually think the political theater is not really on the Republican side of the right wing media. We've been running this stuff out for years. It's on the Democrat side. I think that the fact that this has come to the forefront yet again and is even being covered by mainstream news imprints like NBC News is because it will be a catalyst for getting rid of Joe Biden ahead of or during the convention, given that he is so vegetative and so at risk of helping the Dems lose. So I think the Dems are the ones they will run through the motions on defending Biden. But this amount of dirty laundry that is percolating is going to help catalyze the switcheroo that a lot of us have been talking about. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, reports and suggestions and theories that uh, a lot of the Hunter Biden stuff will be used as a catalyst to push uh, Biden out and he can be given the option to just pardon his son kind of on the way out and then hand over the reins to someone like a Gavin Newsom. Uh, but John Jackson, in uh, just the last minute or so that we have, a lot of uh, the Democrat commentators um, or people who are kind of pushing back have, uh, speaking of political theater, used this idea that Hunter Biden didn't invoke the Fifth Amendment as a way to contrast that between Donald Trump, Eric Trump, and a few um, of the other members of the Trump family that have invoked the Fifth Amendment. Um, I see that as political theater because rights are there protected in the Constitution so that you can exercise them. How do you see it? Well... <laughs> It's 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 a real circus. I I I think that um, it, it it looks bad. It looks really bad. Uh, on as stated earlier, uh, President Biden has some re-election issues, and Democrats have expressed concerns about uh, this. And and you know, President Obama has expressed concerns. Michelle Obama. Um, and this does not help if, if, if we're dealing with close battleground states. So it 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 could be an issue. Right now it's not. Yeah, but and, it could and we'll be leave an it issue. there. Thanks so much to the power panel, John Jackson, Matt Tierman, and John Cardio. Looking forward to having you gentlemen on another power panel. That's it for us on Jenna Ellis tonight. You can always reach me and my team, Jenna, at SalemNewsChannel.com because we're going to get a mailbag up shortly. So emails, questions, comments. I'll see you tomorrow night.